Welcome to episode 109 of the Headspace and Timing podcast. On today's episode, we have the first of a two-part series with Dr. Ed Tick, a nationally recognized expert on veteran mental health. Dr. Tick is the author of several books that are on the bookshelves of veterans and care providers across the world. War in the Soul, Healing Our Nation's Veterans from Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, and Warrior's Return, Restoring the Soul After War. In this episode, we talk about moral injury and the impact that war has on what we believe to be right and wrong in the world. My father-in-law is 95. He's in a memory care unit. He's becoming senile uh, at this advanced stage. Uh, he's been quite well until recently. He was in the combat engineers in World War II. He was in the invasion of Japan. We dropped the bomb. As a combat engineer, his unit was bivouacked only a few miles from Hiroshima. And they went through Hiroshima just a few weeks after the bombing. Now at 95 years old, it's about the only memory left him. And he cries and says, I've had a good life, but maybe I don't deserve it. Did so many Japanese have to die to give me this life? Is that right? Is it good? Is it moral? Should I be here? So moral injury was planted in him and the gift he was given was his life. The curse was moral questioning for the rest of his life, even in the core of his being and his, his worth as a, as a human being. Welcome to the Headspace and Timing Podcast, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes around veteran mental health. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a retired Army non-commissioned officer and a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After retiring from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, then you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set correctly, however, it was just a useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing's not set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support service members, veterans, and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Headspace and Timing podcast. Once again, and as always, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen and learn more about veteran mental health. Uh, I'm excited about today's show because, as you know, if you're a longtime listener or a follower of the blog, uh, one of my concerns um, about veteran mental health is bringing, a, bringing about a greater understanding of a concept called moral injury. Um, I've had Dr. Shira McGinn on the show. I've had uh, Dr. Joseph Currier on the show um, and, and have uh, discussed it pretty extensively um, as maybe being related to or, or really, more importantly, separate from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and so I'm really excited to bring on the show one of the nation's recognized experts on moral injury, uh, Dr. Edward Tick. Uh, Dr. Tick has, uh, has been an author of a couple of books, which I have on my bookshelf, A Warrior's Return, Retor Restoring the Soul After War, War in the Soul, uh, and uh, for a long time had uh, he founded and has, has been um, uh, providing services in New York through the Soldier's Heart Foundation. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Tick to the show. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Honored to be with you and honored to join together in addressing and exploring these really important concepts. Yeah, I, you, well, I would say most of the times I would say that you'd be surprised. You probably wouldn't be surprised. But when I talk to veterans about the comprehensive veteran mental health, um, they've never heard of the term moral injury. They've never uh, considered it. But once they actually hear about it, sort of a light bulb goes off in their mind. Uh, so I'd definitely like to, to hear more about your thoughts on that, of, of which you have many and, uh, and varied. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, sure. Thank you. Uh, I've been working with our veterans for over 40 years. Um, it's important uh, I, to share that I'm not a veteran myself, that I, uh, I grew up during the Vietnam era. I was in college during the height of the war. Uh, I had a student deferment um, 
my first year of college and then a lottery system came along and I was struggling with what I was going to do if I had to go to Vietnam. I determined, and this was a moral choice. Uh, my uncle, my godfather, was a medic at the Battle of the Bulge and MIA uh, behind enemy lines for two months after that. The family didn't know whether or not he would survive. Uh, he did, but he came home with what we would call shell shock. He was shaking in terror the entire rest of his life. And that was my godfather. That was planted in my soul. So I had a, a doc legacy in my family. In conflict over service in the Vietnam War, I determined that if I had to serve, I could only serve as a medic. That was a moral choice. At the same, And then I got a high lottery number, and I didn't have to serve at all. And I will suggest in the context of our conversation today, that was a moral injury to me. But not personally, it was a moral injury to the nation because the nation was not in agreement about the moral necessity of that war. The nation was not in agreement about whether or not we were genuinely physically or ideologically threatened by communism in Vietnam. And so the nation was never aligned in the choice to pursue this war and then introducing the lot. And we know that minority and impoverished people were serving in higher numbers than those of us who were white privileged could go to college. And so introducing the lottery system was itself a moral injury to the nation. You have to serve because we pulled your birthday out of a hat and you never have to do anything. You never have to give anything to our nation. Uh, you never have to give back for all that you've been given. You never have to earn your way as a citizen. You never have to go through any kind of rite of passage to, to transform from child psychology into adult psychology so that you think of others and the welfare of, of the whole first. Uh, all of those things come from, can come from military service, often do, and those who are excluded often stay in a, in a child, uh, childlike mentality, thinking about themselves and what's good for them, not thinking about the whole. So the nation was injured by the Vietnam War. The nation was injured and the generation was injured by the lottery system. And I was looking for my form of service. And, uh, and in direct relation to not having to serve, I wanted to give back in direct response to the wound. And so uh, I received my master's degree in psychology in 1975. I was working on my doctorate. I moved to a rural part of central New York State, and I began, and I was invited into a local medical group to begin practicing psychotherapy. And what do you know, Vietnam vets started to come into my practice. This was about 1976, 77, shortly after the war was over. And neighbors and colleagues said, oh, no, they're crazy. They're dangerous. Keep away from them. But not me. I said, aha, I can serve. I'm called to serve. I wanted to be a doc if I had to serve. Now I'm going to strive to be the best home front doc I possibly can be. And so back then, just a few years after the war, I began working with our returnees and devoted myself to becoming that doc and have been doing it ever since. So my own career, seriously, is a response in large part to the collective moral injury that our nation experienced during the Vietnam War. And I've, it's been a great honor to um, be involved in that work ever since. And, and I have transformed. I've been through my rites of passage and my ordeals and my challenges. And I always thought, and I know you do this too, and you say this in your blogs over and over, find a counselor who really gets it. Find a counselor who can do the genuine moral and spiritual and archetypal journey with you, who understands military service, who understands warriorhood, and really can listen without judgment, without negative civilian attitudes toward the military, but really be with you. And so I've striven to be that kind of person, uh, that kind of helper. And so I've been changed, transformed, initiated, and uh, earned my place in the brotherhood. 
And uh, like you, brother, I though I wasn't literally in the military, all of my service to to veterans and with veterans and the military all these decades has made me much more a veteran and a warrior than I am a civilian. So it's a long, uh, multifaceted, honorific um, journey I've had, and I'm proud of it and proud to share with all of you. You know, that's great. I, I really, we can rub off on people sometimes, us veterans, right? We can, uh-huh. we can uh, add our own particular flavor. Um, it, it's, it's always interesting to me as a mental health professional to hear sort of this, this um, uh, cross generational experience um, because you started working with veterans before PTSD was actually a diagnosis, right? It didn't come out until, you know, 1981 or so. Um, and Correct. so you started, but, but something you said struck me is you started to see Vietnam veterans within 10 years of say the height of the war, right? 67, 68, 69. Yes. And, and, and I'm starting to see post 9-11 veterans um, again, reach out the same about a time frame, eight, 10 years after their experience in the war. Mm-hmm. But I'm also seeing Vietnam veterans for the first time, 50 years. And so that strikes me that we're going to be doing this work with post 9-11 veterans for the next 40 to 50 years. Yeah, let's there, there are a few important observations that you just made. One matter is 10 years. We're seeing them 10 years after the war. Um, perhaps, you know, uh, David Wood's, uh, recent book, whatever we've done, the moral injury of our longest wars. Uh, I've heard Wood, of it. okay. So Wood is a war correspondent. He's been on the front lines with our troops for, for, um, quite a number of wars. Um, in his book, he posits that moral injury doesn't, can't set in while a person is in service. I disagree with that. A little bit, but his larger point is that it takes time, it takes reflection. When we're in the ship, we don't have much time to think about it. And it takes some degree of reflection, distancing, and development of uh, psychological maturity, growing up a little bit to think about what we did and why, and what the surrounding values were, and why our country made it, and to reflect our own, on our own lives. So he's suggesting that. PTSD is instantaneous, the, the biological dimension anyway, but moral injury takes maturity and reflection. And so we can't expect to be seeing people 10, 20, 30 years after their service, looking back at, on it and, and asking what happened to me? How did I change? And what do I, what is my heart and soul, my conscience needing to deal with now? So that seemed to be true for Vietnam that, um, Vets didn't start coming in for a while. We hoped it would be different for the younger generation of veterans, but it seems to be taking the same shape. And this is strange because even though you and I and really hundreds, thousands of our colleagues have said we're going to have the help in place when our people come back this time, unlike Vietnam, it's taking the same pattern of uh, younger veterans in large part, not asking for help, not coming in for the services that we are uh, offering early on, but then later on as they get older um, and the hurt doesn't go away and they see how much their lives have changed, then they come in. Uh, I have taken, oh, here's a good story about this. Uh, I think you know that I take um, veteran, I, I take many people. I lead trips back to Vietnam every year. So I've uh, since 2000, I've led an annual trip back to Vietnam. So I've been back 18 times. I take veterans, um, family members, surviving widows, civilians who have business with Vietnam and people who want to be on a spiritual journey because Vietnam is a, a Buddhist country and is highly spiritual. Uh, I have taken Iraq and Afghanistan veterans to Vietnam. They want to go with their older brothers, the Vietnam vets. And they want to practice reconciliation with former foes, but can't go back to Iraq or Afghanistan yet. 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 We hope someday. So they go back to Vietnam to experience reconciliation with their older brothers. Well, one trip I had two Iraq veterans and 
We went around the circle, came to the Iraq vets. They said, we've talked about this, uh, and we've got one message for all of you from both of us, uh, the two Iraq vets. So this is what we have to say that we, the most important lesson we got out of this journey with you. Dear elder brothers, we've learned not to wait 40 effing years to do our work. We're going to go home at our age. They were about 30 at the time. And we're going to get ourselves in good therapy and work our buns off now because we don't want to grow up with these wounds unresolved and be in our 60s and 70s and like you guys still suffering. You know, that's, it's amazing in, in these idea of going back. Um, I've always said that um, I could see myself going back to Afghanistan um, you ain't getting me back in Baghdad for no reason at all. I am not going to go back to Iraq. Um, but I, I served twice in Afghanistan. I can see myself going back. It was a very beautiful country um, in its own way, like like uh, Vietnam, a very spiritual country, a, very, a lot of uh, very strong beliefs. Um, but, yes. But having two post-9-11 veterans need to go all the way to Vietnam to have the awareness to say – I, I need to do something, right? This awareness is always key, um, and and helping to develop this awareness um, is is huge. And, and you mentioned um, before about how um, how PTSD is instantaneous. I often describe it to my veterans that you know PTSD is an injury of the behavior, right? You know, it's it's you know it's a, more complicated than that. But you know, a, a, a trigger happens and I behave differently. You know. Um, of course, traumatic brain injury and other signature wounds, so to speak, is um, is a physical injury, but moral injury is an injury of the soul, um, and that's something that you have have you know <laughs> long before I said it, but but um, you have identified that it is something akin to, but also very separate from post traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I'd like to hear um, you know how you open up discussions about moral injury, how you explain it. Um, and, and, and its impact on our nation's warriors. Well, um, as you mentioned, my uh, er earlier significant book on the subject was called War and the Soul. And uh, at the time, war well, moral injury was just being discussed as a modern concept. Uh, let me say a number of things about this. One matter is that what we call moral injury is built into the calling of warriorhood. Uh, I, I study uh, the warrior tradition throughout time, throughout history, across cultures, around the world. And what the concept, the moral and spiritual concepts that we're rediscovering today have been built into the awareness of warriorhood since ancient times. So the Bible, for example, is full of trauma, and it's also full of moral and spiritual guidance for how to respond to trauma or how to reduce it. And moral injury is really everywhere in the biblical stories. Uh, everything that we understand now about uh, war trauma and moral injury has been around for thousands of years. And the ancients uh, and traditional cultures, indigenous cultures have known about it. And so... I'm not only studying uh, our modern veteran mental health efforts that you and I and so many of our colleagues are working at and contributing to, but I go all the way back and work with uh, the warrior archetype uh, and all of its manifestations throughout history and the manifestations now. So uh, I think we would, would agree that PTSD can be present without moral injury. That some pe I'm working with a Vietnam vet right now um, who says, I have no moral injury. Um, I believed in the war. I believed it's, it, it's necessity at the time. I still believe we were trying to free the freer Southern people from an oppressive regime that was taking over their country. So I'm okay with having been there and what I did there. But I still have PTSD. I was changed physiologically, fundamentally, the way I think, the way I feel, the way I act by the experience. I'm not troubled, and I don't think I did anything wrong by going there. 
but I am troubled by the changes that I've been through and learning how to deal with them, you know, in marriage and civilian community. So it seems possible that there can be PTSD without moral injury. Uh, at the same time, the concept of moral injury is built into warriorhood because we are trained to kill. We are trained to take lives. We are trained to practice destruction. And a warrior's fundamental values are not dealing death and practicing destruction. A warrior's fundamental values are preservation and protection. Preservation and protection. And a warrior is trained to use lethal force if necessary in order to preserve and protect. When we feel we are truly preserving and protecting our homeland, and it is absolutely necessary, of absolute necessity, and there's no other strategy available for the protection, then history and culture seem to say that then lethal force, warriorhood is necessary. When our warriors don't really feel like they're doing that, but using lethal force for any other reason, then moral injury is inevitable. Even beyond that, just the act of killing itself causes moral injury. Uh, Sitting Bull, who was one of my great teachers, said, he said, um, he said to the rest of us, you don't know what a warrior is. Because a warrior is not someone who takes the life of another because it is always wrong to take another life. A warrior essentially is someone who protects the innocent and the helpless, who serve, who takes care of the elderly, who feeds the hungry, and who takes care of the children in the future of humanity. Sitting Bull was always pointing at preservation and protection and serving the neediest among us. And sometimes force and violence will be necessary for that act. But he said earlier, nobody has the right to take another. So killing always causes injury, even when we decide it's necessary. And we need to realize that and serve our warriors and give them profound moral and spiritual support for the act. Uh, Here's another story regarding this. I I work closely with our Native American veterans and our Native American vets. You probably know this. Our leaders should, our leader, read our, sorry, our listeners should know. Um, Native Americans enlist and serve in American military in a higher percentage than any other ethnic group. They are still trying to, uh, they were warrior societies, so they're still earning their way as warriors in their own cultures and in our culture. And also it is historical that disenfranchised people prove their citizenship and their worth by joining the military. And so our Native Americans are doing both of that. And so I've worked closely with them. Many of them are trained in the warrior traditions of their people, and many of them aren't because their people have lost those traditions. All right, so a man named Will went back to Vietnam with me. He, was, he lived on, the, he was on the, the Flathead Reservation in Montana. At the time, he was in trouble with the law. Um, we had to get permission from his parole board to take him well, out of of the state, let alone out of the country. In this case, they did the right thing and said, we don't know what to do with him. Please take him. Sometimes the authorities are cooperative and and get it. Well, this is Will's story. In his very first firefight, he was faced off with a Viet Cong soldier. Will was raised in a traditional manner as a hunter and a warrior. This, the soldier and the enemy soldier and he faced off. They both aimed their weapons at each other. Their eyes met. Suddenly it became personal and human, not impersonal. When their eyes met, the Viet Cong soldier raised his weapon and wouldn't fire. 
it was Will's first firefight, and he was scared, and he fired and killed the man. He walked up to the body, and he took out a pouch of sacred herbs that he carried in his pocket, and he began to sprinkle the herbs over the body and sing a traditional native death chant. His sergeant came over and smacked him on the head and cursed him out and ordered him back. Stop. Okay. For all, about 45 years, Will had PTSD and moral injury and was really trouble on his reservation. We went back to Vietnam together. I feel teary sharing this with you. So it's, it's really beautiful. We went to Vietnam. We went to Doc Tho where, this, where he fought, where this battle happened. We found the spot where it happened. And right then and there, with our group of veterans and civilians and with Vietnamese who joined us, he finished the ceremony. He finished praying for that soul. He had been taught as a warrior and hunter, he's responsible for the spirit of any of the lives he took. So he was trained not only how to kill, but what to do when to kill and how to be spiritual and how to help the soul of the slain. Warrior traditions of the world have this. All the Native American traditions, African warrior traditions, Middle Eastern warrior traditions. Um, ancient, in ancient times, the Judeo, early Judaism and Christianity had these traditions. You can't kill with impunity without spiritual tending of ourselves, each other, and the fallen. So, Will finished the ceremony then and there 45 years later. Several days later, we were in a veteran treatment program in Hanoi, where we met about two dozen NVA veterans, and a couple of them had been in the same battle. And so Will and these others hugged as long lost brothers who had survived the same hell. And they shared stories, and they forgave each other, and they teased. We were fighting over the same hill, a good thing. Good thing you're a bad shot. You missed me. Ha ha. Well, you missed me too. And they swore brotherhood and allegiance for the rest of their lives together, carrying their different sides of the same story. Will came back to the United States so happy, clean, free of both PTSD and moral injury, utterly joyous. Now he's back on his reservation and he's the, the war dance chief, resurrecting the old practices from the elders and from their tradition and giving them to the young men and women who are serving now. So they have both modern American military training and the moral and spiritual legacy of their people and its warriorhood to practice. Okay. We have, we have to fight, but, but before, during and after service and for the, our entire lives, there are spiritual and cultural and moral practices that we can do with each other and we'll do in our community so that we can be well and clean and strong after service. And now people on Will's Res say, he walks around with his grin as bright as the sun all the time. What happened to him when he went back to Vietnam the second time? So we can get morally clean. We can rely on our ancient warrior traditions. We can teach our people not only the the arts of warfare, but also the spiritual support that has to surround them so we don't break down when we do them. That is an amazing story, um, and, and as you said, an emotional one. And just hearing that, again, just like it took those two um, you know, young warriors to go to Vietnam to find this peace, um, that it took Will um, to go back to find the peace. And, mm -hmm. and hearing in that, and this is definitely something I want to touch on about um, – there's elements of spirituality and, and ritual. As you're talking about this, we do have rituals, but it's for our own loss. When we're, when we're in country, so to speak, we have our own memorial ceremonies for those that we've mm -hmm. lost, right? And it is a, the, the military in its infinite wisdom has created a, a way that it's supposed to be done and the difference between a memorial service and a ceremony and things like that. Um, but you're right. We've never, um, I think... You know, I know that as a platoon sergeant um, in combat, um, never, you know, created any kind of ritual around things that we did. Um, 
before I get in, before we get into that, I want to give you this one thing though, because as you were talking about um, the need to preserve and protect, and that's what we're sort of meant to do, um, I get a sense that if on the glo- geopolitical level that there's no reason for um, uh, preserve and protect, then we take that to our personal level. And I was there to preserve and protect my soldiers or our yeah. buddies, right? That we will transition that preserve and protect. And and as listeners uh, have known, and uh, and and also you know those who read the blog, I make no um, no secret about it. One of the reasons why moral injury is so significant to me is is I I experience it myself. And what you just said made me realize that it's because I tell myself that I failed to preserve and protect someone specifically, Edwiga's mm-hmm. Wolf, that I I made decisions to um, to allow her to go on a patrol in which she was killed, that I failed to preserve and protect her. But, but I've also said I've never, you know, lost a moment of sleep about enemy dead, but I, I carry the burden of what that has done to my soldiers. And I tell myself that I failed to preserve and protect them from the horrors of war as if I could. Right. But that's what I tell oh, myself. Mm-hmm. And, and that idea of failing to preserve and protect on the personal level has an element of moral injury. Oh, goodness, yes. Yes. And that extends from our battle buddies, of course, from the person right next to us in the foxhole to the people you're in charge with, as you were as a squad leader. And it it does extend to the civilians. Uh, And it can extend to the foe. Will suffered for many reasons, but not only because I took a life and I didn't do the closing ritual. He also suffered because, as he said, the that enemy soldiers and my eyes met and we saw each other's humanness in an instant. And his exact words were, he let me live. He raised his rifle and let me live. I wasn't present enough at the moment to realize what he was doing and to ask if I should let him live. I just fired. I was trained to. I was frightened. So um, he even wondered if he failed to preserve and protect that life. Uh, the life that I was trying to help him. Uh, a man, uh, an elder warrior I knew well, who just died at age 97 last October. He uh, was, he was, he, Vietnamese who fought against the Japanese in World War II, the French in their war, and and the Americans in our war. He was noted for having his his unit having captured several Americans in their fighting in the Mekong Delta. And when his squad members became angry and hostile and wanted to beat, harm, even kill their prisoners, he put himself between his men and the prisoners. And he said... When they were armed and fighting, we had to fight to kill to protect ourselves. But now they're unarmed and they're our prisoners. That makes them our guests, and we're responsible for their lives now. So he was able to control the switches in himself. When were we fighting and when are we preserving? When is it necessary to kill and when must we restrain ourselves? These are really difficult matters, and you're right that in combat it becomes very, very personal about the people we encounter, our people and the people we're encountering. It, we don't think about the geopolitical dimensions much <laughs> when we're in combat and we're just trying to keep ourselves and our buddies al- alive. We think about those later. So maybe 10 years later, we say not only what were the personal dimensions, the personal relationships involved. Why was I there and do I believe that it was necessary or not? And if I may, I'd like to turn that question on you in this way. Uh, I've worked with many of our vets who, like you, were in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And like you said, I'd never want to go back to Baghdad, but I'd like to go back to the country because it's beautiful. Beauty is also a spiritual matter. Beauty is food for the soul. We don't want to harm what's beautiful. We want to be restored by it. But my question is regarding moral injury. 
and even the geopolitical dimensions. A lot of vets I've worked with who were in both Iraq and Afghanistan said, and I'm not saying my belief, I'm just sharing theirs and I want to ask you. They said, Iraq was wrong, Afghanistan was right. Iraq was a moral injury because we didn't, I don't believe, I, the vet, I don't believe we really needed to be there and it proved that there were never any weapons of mass destruction. However, Afghanistan really is a, sort, uh, a seat of terrorism and the people really are being horribly abused uh, by the dominant powers. And so I regret I was in Iraq and it's a moral injury to have served there. I'm glad I was in Afghanistan. It was morally right to serve there. Now, in this case, the veterans have had some time to reflect and maybe even study. And so they're, they are looking at their service, judging what was morally necessary and justified and what wasn't. So in that case, they're going from the personal to the geopolitical. And they are saying about the personal that whatever happened in Iraq was wrong because we shouldn't have been there. So even the personal actions were, are, are tainted, but not in Afghanistan. And I've even worked with a couple of veterans. This is interesting. Healing moral injury from Afghanistan. I've worked with a couple of vets who admitted to killing prisoners, which is we judge as immoral and is against the Geneva Convention. They said, I'm thinking of two guys, separate occasions, but they each said, I don't feel moral injury. I don't feel guilt. My conscience isn't disturbed because I know the atrocities that they committed. I, in fact, in one case, I found their victims. I captured him with his victims and I saw what he did. And so I felt utterly justified in taking that life. Um, now, another story from Afghanistan is, boy, we're bringing up so many morally challenging and ambiguous situations that our troops live in, and maybe that helps our listeners understand how complicated this can get. Right. Right. A chaplain who served in Afghanistan, I helped him in his chaplain education and training. I was on his chaplain ministry support team the entire time he was in Afghanistan. So we were having regular Skype calls to help him, well, tolerate his, his deployment and serve his, his battalion as best as he could. He did institute memorial services, not just for our people, as you experienced and is necessary and is right, but also for civilians that were killed and also for enemy troops that our people slew with the argument that killing, even when it's justified, it still causes a moral injury. We've released the soul to the other side. We've got to pray for them and let them go. Uh, his CEO said he was harmful to the mission and sent them home and tried to have him court-martialed for that. His troops liked it. His congregation grew significantly while he was in Afghanistan, but command wouldn't tolerate it. So question to you is, do you judge your Iraq and Afghanistan deployments differently based uh, on this profound and difficult um, scale of moral injury? And you know and and what do you think about, well, Will and this chaplain saying we need, for our, our own troops' sake, for the sake of all of our souls, we need to somehow um, tend and, and pray for the fallen of all, uh, of all classes? You know, I think uh, the, the question about do I judge them differently, um, the initial answer is no, um, mm. but it's – but it's uh, like many things more complicated than that. My father was a Vietnam veteran, fought in um, yeah. 68, 69. Um, and then as he and I were talking later, and this I think was even after I had retired, um, he said that um, he went to war with an 18-year-old brain and I went to war with a 32-year-old brain. Um, I had, I had joined in the mid nineties. And so I, mm -hmm. my service spanned both pre and post nine 11. And so I had, I was already a Sergeant first class in E7 by the time that I went to Iraq. 
um, and Afghanistan, both of my tours in Afghanistan. Um, and so I was already a senior leader. I was already um, in a level of, of a mindset where, um, where again, that preserve and protect was my mission. The, the morality was based on um, mm. I had already drank the army's Kool-Aid for a very long time and, yeah. and I had bought into, you know, uh, ours is not to question why ours is not to do or die. I, I think that my hesitance really to, to not go back to Baghdad was, it, it was not beautiful. Um, but also just some of the experiences there, um, uh, the explosive force projectiles, it was very, very destructive. I, I saw the ultimate, um, uh, damage that was done there, um, but I think that in, in my first um, deployment was in Bosnia way back in the mid nineties and, and seeing what we did there in the Balkans, mm -hmm. I felt, I didn't understand why we were there, right. Are, are we there for, you know, what Russian oil? And I, but I had to put it on a personal level with say, well, we're, we're the teacher getting in between the kids on the playground and we're preserving life at the base mm -hmm. of the mountain um, where our camp was, there was a, an orphanage, a war orphanage um, and seeing all of these kids that had been um, orphaned and, and hearing the stories about what happened as the, the Serbians and the Croatians um, had, had gone through Bosnia. Um, that was enough justification for me to tell me yeah. I am doing the right thing. Uh, and mm -hmm. so I, I had that experience as an 18 year old. Um, I had, and so I brought that into my Iraq and Afghanistan experience, um, and I tried to import, impart that to my soldiers. And, and this is the, the, the leadership's role in, um, yes. in keeping – because that, that sergeant kept Will from completing his, his, um, his duties, right? The right. leader um, right. facilitated moral injury. Um, right. the, the colonel, you know, um, wanted to, to court-martial the chaplain. Um, the chaplain was actually in a leadership role trying to um, avoid moral injury from from becoming uh, significant. Um, yes, but leadership yeah. was was um, was complicit perhaps in that. Um, and, and this idea is I always tried to and this makes it the stories that we have. I had one particular gunner. Um, who he made an amazing shot. It was like 350 meters across a river on top of a cliff. It was, I mean, it was just an amazing, you know, and, and, and it was a, and I was talking to him later and I was like, and that was a great shot. Um, and, and it was entirely justified. Uh, and, you know, and just, you know, how'd you do it, whatever. And he was like, oh, it was just like the video games, right? I just lifted my gun and I, and I stopped and I said, whoa, guy, that wasn't a video game. The, let's mm -hmm. let's slow mm -hmm. down and and I need mm -hmm. you to understand that that was a human life, and that that was something that um, that was very significant in your life. And don't just pass it off as if I was playing Call of Duty. Um, and mm -hmm. so, and not to say, of course, that that I was you know any of the greatest leader, but there's a leadership responsibility. You keep talking about warrior elders. Warrior elders have a responsibility for the care and concern for the warriors that are coming behind them. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that. And I'm really glad that you were there as an old man. <laughs> I'm so, really, uh, you're right. old enough to, yeah. You, you're the uncle. You're more than the elder brother. If there's your experience from, uh, from being in Bosnia and you're a 30-something-year-old leading 18-year-olds. You're the, you're the wise elder. You reminded me immediately of a medevac pilot I worked with 20 years in, and he said, also, he was in Bosnia. He said, that was moral service. We needed to be there. Those people were slaughtering each other, and I'm very glad I was there. Uh, and it laid down a moral foundation that made me carry that, just like you, carried, I carried it with me through 20 years of service. And I evaluated other times of service in other countries based on re whether we were really getting between the combatants and saving civilians and reducing conflict. So, uh, so he had moral standards like you that he carried through all service. It's so important. Um, in the Art of War, Sun Tzu said um, – the most important thing officers and leaders can do is to be moral examples for their troops 
keeping, uh, expressing moral values and keeping the troops um, within moral reins and the, the degree to which the leaders do that and appear as good fathers loving and guiding their children to that degree the troops will be willing, happily willing to follow those leaders and serve well in their campaign. So it's really important that our troops know and see moral leadership in leaders. Even the Bible said that. The Bible said the, in, the common soldiers are just responsible for themselves, but their officers are, res, officers are responsible for all of them and have to do more prayer and more sacrifice for everybody's survival, not just the individual survival. So this is an old and important concept as well. And we're both saying 18-year-olds don't necessarily develop it. And as you said, um, you had an adult brain and an 18 year old brain is still developing. And we all know by now through all the, the important brain research that's being done that the brain doesn't stop growing and developing until the mid twenties. And we might even wonder if we should pe send people into combat before the brain's done developing, but we do. <laughs> No, that's uh, that's entirely accurate. I, I think you know, and I'd never considered that of of my, and, and not to say, uh, and you've said it elsewhere as a pejorative term, but my moral justification that I experienced in in Bosnia, um, I never considered how that helped me as I went into Iraq and as mm. I went into um, Afghanistan, two of the most kinetic, um, and and honestly um, violent. Uh, deployments that I had, uh, that, that there, I, I've always said that there is a different type of moral injury for leaders compared to, um, the yeah. individual soldiers, right. You know, yeah. and, and, and I, and I don't know that I've ever fully, you know, sort of developed that, but the, the individual soldier is, you know, I took a life or, or I swapped with a buddy and he lost his life and I didn't. And so there's that survivor's guilt. Um, yes. but, but the burden of command, the burden of leadership, um, adds its own element of of mm -hmm. potential moral injury. Yes, yes, it sure does. It sure does. In contrast to the chaplain I named who was sent home, another chaplain in Afghanistan was able to create a good um, advisory relationship with his battalion commander. They were on convoy. They were supposed to be getting there really quickly to their destination. They had to go through a small village. Uh, the entire village came out and crowded into the, the one thoroughfare that went through the village. The commander ordered them just high speed through the village. The chaplain said, no, sir, we can't. There's nobody shooting us. Not, there's no, nothing going on here. We do need to get where we're going quickly, but it's not an SOS. It's not, they're not in danger and dying if we don't get there. It only take five more minutes to go around the village and nobody will be hurt. We don't have to run over anybody this time. The commander took a deep breath and said, chaplain, you're right. Ordered the convoy around the village. They got where they needed to be in time anyway and everybody was safe. And there was the collaboration between command and chaplain that is supposed to provide moral leadership to our people in the front. That time it worked. No, and it is. It's, a, it's amazing to see um, when it worked. Um, it, this has been great. Um, and, uh, and, and is, is our time here. I, I, I need to have you back on because we, we haven't even touched on a couple of different things. You wanted to talk about, uh, the right. pathologizing of post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I believe there are things that go beyond PTSD and TBI. We really didn't get into the spiritual aspects of moral injury and how to heal that. Um, so, so I, I definitely am going to, going to want to be able to have you come back on. Um, but I'd like to give you maybe a few minutes for maybe some closing thoughts on what we talked about here today. Oh, sure. Um, my closing, uh, my first closing thought is one more story, if I can squeeze that in. Sure. Absolutely. And it's quite personal to, uh, we 
put my choke up on this, but your words about I don't want to go back to Baghdad because of the hideous degrees of explosions that I saw. It was too horrible, too violent. I don't want to see that again. My father-in-law is 95, and he is now um, – he's in a memory care unit. He's becoming senile uh, at this advanced stage. Uh, he's been quite well until recently, surprisingly, blessedly well for his age and his experience. He was in the combat engineers in World War II. He was in the second line following our combat troops all the way across Europe. So – he saw all the destruction, and it was his job to clean it up. Uh, he gladly says, his whole life he said, I'm so glad. I, it was horrible to see that destruction, but I'm so glad I never had to fire a weapon at anybody. He was in the invasion of Japan. We dropped the bomb. As a combat engineer, his unit was bivouacked only a few miles from Hiroshima. And they went through Hiroshima just a few weeks after the bombing. Now, yeah, now at 95 years old, it's about the only memory left him. Mm. Everything else has disappeared, and it's as if that became, has become the central memory of his life oh, against which he measures everything else. And he cries and says, I've had a good life. I had three daughters, including my dear wife. <laughs> um, but I had three daughters and I had a good life, but maybe I don't deserve it. Did so many Japanese have to die to give me this life? Is that right? Is it good? Is it moral? Should I be here? And as he gets closer and closer to death, that becomes more and more the focus, the unanswerable question. So moral injury was planted in him, and the gift he was given was his life. And the curse was moral questioning for the rest of his life, even in the core of his being, in his his worth as a, as a human being. So uh, we really are, brother, we really do play with fire, and we should be wise in how we do it, and I'd be honored to continue this conversation. Um, I think what I would summarize from today's conversation is that you and I and our warriors learn that the moral dimensions of service are of utmost importance, that... Sadly, our mental health system until recent years has been remiss in addressing them. But with the concept of moral injury, we're starting to catch up. Um, that there is moral and spiritual wisdom in the warrior legacy that has been given to us from worldwide sources. And uh, I've been mining those, as you know, and we should continue to. And that the more together as a nation we explore and discuss the moral and spiritual dimensions um, as well as the broken brain dimensions of service, um, the better off we'll be to not just, we're not going to stop war, um, but to create better warriors, healthier warriors, and a wiser and more moral nation in how and when we use force. So we, that, that's a heavy load um, but we really are about helping our military and our nation uh, stick more accurately and truthfully to uh, a moral course through history. Oh, that's, uh, that's great, and that is definitely uh, words of wisdom. And, uh, and, and again, uh, definitely not going to be the last time that, that we have this discussion because I think today laid a very good groundwork, uh, groundwork of of what the concept what some of these things that we're dealing with are um and in the next time i'd like to be able to have a conversation about um how we as mental health professionals can help veterans and help warriors through this so thank you for coming on the show today you're very welcome honored to be with you and look forward to the next time absolutely You're listening to Headspace and Timing, where we're trying to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health.
There's a lot to unpack from this episode. We could talk for another hour about the thoughts and concepts that Dr. Tick shared. His impression of the response to returning soldiers as a moral injury of the nation rings true. It's something that is a shared responsibility. This doesn't mean that you or I or any veteran requires this of the nation. This is not a sense of entitlement that means that our nation owes us. While there are a number of veterans who believe that the country owes them for something for their service, there are a greater number that recognize that we were just doing what we chose to do. Not requiring support, however, does not mean that there is no obligation to support. I support my community. I support my spouse and children. Not because I'm forced to or find it a burden, but because I want to. I personally feel that we have an obligation to support others and in turn be supported. This show is a great example. I feel like there's a gap in the communication between veterans and the mental health community, and I have the means and ability to bridge that gap in some small way. Not because the veteran and the mental health community demand it, or because I'm being paid to do it, but because it's something that I believe in and think that it can help. That's what real support for our service members can and should be. The community helping those who served, not because the service members demand it, or because they think that they deserve it. Support for veterans should be given because it can help those that bore much on behalf of the country. After Dr. Tick and I finished this conversation, there was still a lot more to talk about, like I mentioned at the end of the show. Due to his time constraints in mind, we were unable to keep talking, even though I wanted to. So we continue the conversation, and that conversation will be released in the next episode. Thanks for taking the time to listen. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, go to VeteranMentalHealth.com forward slash HST109. While you're there, share the link to the show with somebody that you think might enjoy it. We're always looking for guests, either veterans or those who support them. You can drop me a line at info at veteranmentalhealth.com to recommend guests, or you can go to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash guest to fill out a suggestion or request. Just a reminder that the guests and information in this show are for educational purposes only and not meant to be considered professional advice. If something you've heard makes you think that you should talk to somebody, then reach out to do so. I'd like to thank Doc Todd for giving us permission to use his track, Not Alone, from his album Combat Medicine. Doc's trying to bring the discussion about veteran mental health out of the darkness and into the light, and you can see all of his work at therealdoctod.com. Be on the lookout for another great episode, and until then, remember veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The struggle is real, found a piece and lost a soul Eventually my drinking, it got out of control There in darkness I roam, struggling to find home See suddenly death didn't feel so alone 22 a day, destination unknown It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies, co-created many knees Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me R.I.P., I ran the grind in tranquility Authentic tendency, embrace my ability from your forehead it's time man you've been through enough pain stand up it's time to stand back up all my veterans man army marine corps navy air force coast guard get up you know oh, I